Thank you. And um, I'm delighted to be here today with Raman Bhatia, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Ovo Energy. And Ovo is a fascinating company that is in the middle of the energy crisis, which has now become a political issue, and also occupies the space of a technology company with what you offer to customers and households. So maybe we can start by talking a little bit about the crisis. The cost of energy has ballooned. It's dry, driving higher inflation and fueling the worst cost of living crisis that the UK has seen for decades. Um, the government has promised to freeze prices, but the best way to keep down bills has to be to use less. So, Raman, how can technology help people to use less energy? Thank you, uh, Rachel, for having me here, first of all. I think this is a real challenging time when it comes to energy bills, cost of living uh, issues. My teams and I have been on the phone calls with customers, and there are some real harrowing challenges around customers having to choose between uh, feeding families or paying bills. So against this backdrop, the intervention from the government around um, providing support for energy bills is very meaningful and timely. But if you go back to the challenge, uh, the energy crisis is a crisis of fossil fuels at the end of the day. And the long-term opportunity here is to wean us off fossil fuels, and that's where Ovo comes in. We are a scaled, tech-enabled energy supplier, uh, four and a half million customers, more than 10 years old in the UK. Now, before we go into more interesting technologies around, uh, say, decarbonization, there is a real opportunity to drive energy efficiency, demand reduction, smartly. And I think that's, uh, uh, that's something we need to do immediately. We have the uh, leakiest homes uh, in Europe. Uh, an average UK home loses heat uh, three times faster than, say, in Germany and Sweden. So insulation, uh, more prosaic uh, interventions to drive energy efficiency, guiding customers to use energy more smartly. And this is where I think the uh, opportunity presented by smart meters, smart thermostats, linking all of this uh, data together uh, is, uh, is the opportunity we need to go after right away. So first, knowing what you're using and yeah. what and how you're using it within the home can help you to reduce energy. Um, we have a poll question for the audience about how you're planning to use energy this winter and if you're going to uh, closely watch it and, and alter your behaviour. Um, so while you're voting on that, um, I'll just read it for you. So how closely will you be watching your energy use this winter? And your options are, I won't do anything differently. I'll be turning down the heating and the lights off whenever I can, or my smart home optimizes all that for me. And, and what would your answer be, Rowan? Well, I think <laughs> I, um, it is becoming C. Uh, I, I am embracing uh, the... Uh, uh, the automation opportunities presented by um, you know, just the mobile technology that can help you program a lot of this. But I think even before that, uh, there is an opportunity to make uh, energy transition, energy efficiency work for everyone. Mm -hmm. And having worked in uh, fintech before, digital inclusion is very close to my heart. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, we include everyone in this transition. So that's why even before you go into uh, mobile tech, uh, you need to supplement that, complement that with uh, energy advice offered on the phone, for example. That's why we are training a number of our customer service agents to be uh, what we are calling home energy uh, efficiency advisors. Mm -hmm. In many cases, they will offer basic advice around insulation of your loft, and in some cases, they will dispatch people to your homes to actually do an audit. And then in, uh, in many other instances, it will come down to uh, adoption of smart thermostats, smart meters, and if you have an EV, linking that to uh, what's happening inside your home and then really tapping into the opportunities around flexibility. So you use energy when it's cheap, it's also clean at the same time. All of that can be done through smart home uh, tech. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is quite an interesting 
um, result from that showing perhaps oh. the size of the opportunity when it comes to the smart home. We can see that everybody or the majority of people in the room are aware, but perhaps don't have the technology and the tools themselves to kind of change their energy use apart from quite crudely by just turning stuff off. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about that you were sort of touching on there is the kind of idea of energy independence and perhaps things like rooftop solar, having an EV, how the, what the smart home looks like, um, and also how that links to decarbonizing as well and the longer term goals. Yeah. So I think if you imagine a typical UK home, I go back to the uh, first and foremost, the opportunity around insulation. It's not on the glamorous end of decarbonization, but we still have the draftiest, leakiest homes in Europe. So you do insulation first, and then when you come inside uh, the home, 80% of our homes are still powered by uh, you know, gas-powered boilers. Electrification of heat, and there are competing technologies there, uh, you know, electric heat pumps. Uh, there are targets around 600,000 by 2028. We have a long way to go there, but decarbonization of heat is an urgent imperative for us in the UK. Now, we go on the roof, uh, solar penetration, we are not the brightest country uh, in the world, the sunniest country, but there is still a tremendous scope for solar. Right now, that's less than 4 or 5% of UK homes where uh, solar is creating electricity, and that can increase many-fold. And when you go outside the home into, um, uh, if you have a car, if it's an EV, uh, then the interaction of that with what's happening inside your home becomes very interesting. Uh, you can have uh, shifting of your consumption patterns. And for select users, uh, the tech is now becoming bi-directional. So for instance, your EV then can have a battery which will uh, sell energy back to the grid. Now, the interaction with a smarter grid makes it even more interesting because you, you have the, the makings of a new energy system. I think there are about enough cars uh, in the UK, EVs in the UK now, if they were to become bi-directional, they can power more than 100,000 homes. So that opportunity is actually real and present now. We just have to design the right um, incentive structures, and we as OVO need to play a key role in addressing customer confusion, complexity around all of this. And it is complex at the moment. So do you think owning an EV will be that tipping point for people towards caring more about their energy use because you have this you know, car that you need to charge and you're thinking about charging it at the cheapest time, whereas at the moment we don't really think, we just think about using energy when we need it. Yes, and uh, actually that's proven now. There are studies showing uh, EV adoption does create greater engagement around uh, time of usage, flexibility, and then the interaction between that and what's happening inside your home. Uh, and it will increase uh, over the years. And I'd like to return to the idea of the kind of just transition and how we as the UK and OVO as a company kind of make sure that the smart home isn't just something yeah. that the wealthiest homes can take advantage of. You know, how do you incorporate that into social housing and different levels of society? Yeah. Well, I think if you take decarbonization as a shared mutual agenda, it has, to be, it has to work for everyone, and it has to work as a team sport as well. Everyone needs to play a part, all stakeholders, and we have a key role as an energy supplier to make sure energy transition is an inclusive one. So for instance, we are working with local government authorities all over the UK to um, uh, retrofit uh, social housing. Um, there are 15 live projects all over the country. We have, in fact, installed uh, electric heat pumps in uh, in 1,000 uh, homes uh, across the country. And I think that th th this is where government plays a key role, uh, and there are some existing schemes which create the incentive structure for suppliers as well as uh, reduces barriers for uh, people who may not be able to afford smart tech um, and smart decarbonization uh, services. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point because a lot of people say that you can't be driven by the lowest common denominator. You know, technology has to move forward and all of these things have to be developed at pace, but it's about sort of bringing yeah. everybody with you as, as easily as you can. Um, 
And I would just like to go back a little bit to some of the things that you mentioned about electric vehicles and you know, bi-directional charging. And how much thought do you give to things like how do you make sure that you, know, you must know a lot about people's behavior and how they interact with yes. technology? And how do you stop that um, super peak in the evening where everybody comes home from work, plugs in their car, turns everything on in their home, and we get this giant peak in electricity demand you yeah. know, what incentives are there that will stop that happening? Sure. So I think the first thing there is driving engagement around energy usage. Uh, again, fintech comes to mind. The whole uh, realm of uh, money management, and I was uh, leading HSBC's digital bank, uh, and we had so many uh, different experiments, opportunities to drive uh, people's engagement around saving outcomes, investment outcomes, the same tech is available in energy now. In fact, we have something called Energy Tracker, uh, which is uh, a mobile app-based solution which helps you make those decisions, exactly the ones you pointed out. The grid is uh, pretty dirty and expensive between 4 and 7 p.m., for instance. So maybe not use your tumble dryer if you have one uh, at that point. And then when you interact with your EV, then Ovo, as a energy supplier can actually stitch together an experience where you have a new tariff uh, where we'll guide you around uh, flexibility and the time of usage, uh, which will then help you save money uh, and also help you uh, drive further engagement around your energy system and the, the home as a whole. Mm -hmm. And this is happening now. And it will become even more of a reality when smart meters can uh, share data every 30 minutes. So imagine intraday, peak management uh, is, is a reality now, but at scale, it becomes very compelling. Yeah. It's interesting, that kind of engagement that people need to have and that attitude that has to almost completely transform in energy because before yeah. this crisis, you know, one of the things that the regulator Ofgem was trying to do was get people to switch supplier because just saving 200 quid wasn't enough to make people want to, to you know, change. And then nowadays, you know, that would be a huge driver for people. So it's, it's interesting to see that kind of shift. And do you think that people are interested in their app and looking at, you know, their energy use, or do they want to just, you know, use that term set and forget? I think there's a combination. Uh, as you rightly point out, the energy crisis um, is acting as a forcing mechanism for all of us to really confront our energy usage. Uh, Energy Tracker, the app I mentioned, we've seen a 250% increase in, uh, in adoption and just the eyeballs uh, around it. Uh, but as I said, th this needs to be a combination of digital technologies as well as uh, hand-holding for people who are perhaps not uh, in that digital fold. Uh, and, and I think a combination of that then can drive engagement around energy, which is uh, about smarter consumption, not necessarily using less, but using better and smarter. Yes, I think when we were talking before, you yeah. mentioned how efficiency can kind of help you preserve your lifestyle rather than this feeling of having to cut back on everything and not be able to do the things that yeah. you want to do that involve energy. Um, and I guess maybe for the final question, um, what do you think the lasting impact of this crisis will be? Do you think it will give the energy efficiency, you know, the kick that it needs to get going? Because we're not really hearing that message from government. And what are your expectations? Expectations. We were talking a little bit before we came in about what people will do this winter. Um, do you think they'll use less energy overall, maybe at the beginning and throughout? Well, I think the polls suggest that is true. Uh, people will be more mindful. But uh, let's go back to the crisis and the long-term opportunity. I think that's where I started, and that's the uh, you know, over mission to power uh, clean uh, energy for everyone. And I think the long-term way out of uh, the, the crisis is to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, to drive adoption of uh, alternative renewable technologies. There's a lot being said about production, supply, security, generation. All that is great. Our job as OVO is to make sure, uh, as a retailer with no upstream um, assets, we want to make sure that we stand for consumers. We reduce complexity, we create seamless experiences so that people in their homes and around the home
can really confidently embrace uh, what new technology has to offer. And I hope this uh, crisis acts as a catalyst for all of that. I think it would be really interesting to come back and ask you these same questions in maybe a year or two and see how things have changed. Yeah. Um, but I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for well, your time, Raman. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.